Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is going to be a short introduction on to how to practice mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness. Everyone is doing it. It's even made the cover of Time and Newsweek in the last past few years. And so you've probably heard a lot more people talking about mindfulness and or meditation, mindfulness being a very specific and very basic form of meditation. And it's been increasing in interest because of the exciting research behind it. And a lot of the interest in mindfulness comes from the fact that many of us practice mindlessness on a regular basis. As the caption reads, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your mind is? So like so many things, it's often helpful to begin defining something by starting with what it's not. So here's a list of things that mindfulness is not. The first is, it's not simply a relaxation technique. Mindfulness actually isn't about just kind of sit there and relax. And, and there are certain visualization and other types of meditation that are about kind of getting yourself to relax in a very kind of linear and direct way, but that's not the main purpose, actually, of mindfulness. So it's not simply about relaxation. And you'll notice if you, when you start practicing this, you actually have to focus, and it does take a certain amount of work to do that. It's not about simply stopping your thoughts or trying to get to having no thoughts whatsoever. A lot of people think no thoughts means you're doing it right, and it's not about stopping your thoughts. It's going to be, as we're going to see, about watching your thoughts and watching that process kind of ebb and flow. It's not about going into a magical trance state. Don't worry, you will not be levitating off your chair. Um, so it's not about a trance state or some kind of hocus-pocus, foo-foo, woo-woo, weird type of tra trance thing where you're speaking in tongues or floating. It's not about developing special powers. You will not become psychic, unfortunately, or for better or worse. Um, not develop, develop any type of special magical powers. This is not about running away from reality, although some people use meditation that way. That is not the ultimate purpose and how it's meant to be used. Um, it's actually more about getting in touch with reality. And it's not only something that's for monks or religious people. Um, it is really almost more important for those of us who live in day-to-day -day real world to be practicing mindfulness and being present in order to manage the stress of daily life. So now let's start looking at what mindfulness is. And we're going to have three different layers here of the definition. So at the first layer, it is a basic careful attention to the moment-by-moment -moment flow of experience, both internal and external. So it's about putting your attention in the present moment. And being in the here and now and noticing what's going on in the present. So it's about being fully present. At the next level, it's about being fully present and then being receptive and non-judgmental and non-interfering with what is going on in the present moment. It's about observing what's going on in the present moment without judging it as good or bad, preferred or unpreferred. So rather than, it's about seeing just what is there without adding that whole extra layer of what I want things to be. And generally for most of us, what we see and our judgment as to whether or not we want it are so fused together that we have an automatic, knee-jerk, emotional reaction um, to almost every experience from the temperature to what another person is saying, wearing, doing. Um, to, to anything that might be going on in our environment that we tend to go through and constantly, almost automatically react emotionally in a, you know, as we like it or we dislike it. And what mindfulness is doing is actually being present and just seeing what is and slowing down that non-judgmental experience and just experiencing it without judgment for a short period of time, as you'll find out. Now, when it comes to developing a non-judgmental receptivity to what we see going on in our mind, I think uh, Rumi's poem, The Guest House, provides a beautiful and very vivid description of what this is like. So I'm going to go ahead and read this. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. 
He may be cleaning you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. And the spirit of this poem really captures a sense of what it's like to practice mindfulness. As you can tell, it can be very difficult at times to just observe those things that we try to avoid, anger, frustration, pain. And the idea is to learn how to observe that, invite them in, and let them move through our lives without overreacting to them. Because as the point po points out, we never know quite what is the purpose for what's going on. So the final layer I want to talk about is that mindfulness encourages a shift in focus from fusing with the content of our experience to observing its process. And throughout most of our, our everyday experience, we are fused that when something happens, we react to it, and that reaction feels like it, it is us, and we have no identity separate from it. Rather, what mindfulness is doing is cultivating this ability to experience anger without being the angry person and to be able to be a person who experiences anger in this moment rather than an, becoming an angry person. And often so much our emotions were so fused with them that they kind of take over and run the show rather than us being able to observe that, yes, I'm feeling angry right now. That is what's going through. But also knowing and observing that that anger is going to ebb, it's going to flow, it's going to move, it may turn to sadness, it may stay anger, it may go away completely. And so it's becoming more of this observer of our experience is what happens through the pr practice of mindfulness. So as we get to the heart of mindfulness, what it's doing is cultivating an inner witness a part of ourselves that is able to witness our life in a reflective way, in a thoughtful way, rather than just automatically knee-jerk reacting to everything, which generally gets most of us in more in trouble than helping things. When <laughs> the moment we feel anger, if we automatically knee-jerk react to it, we generally make things worse rather than better. When we feel pain or hurt and we automatically knee-jerk react to it, we generally create more upset rather than less upset. So it's creating this pause, this witnessing ability that's able to take things in and reflect on them and make much better decisions as we move forward or sometimes even dissolve um, what seemed initially as a problematic emotion. And this inner witness, this ability to inner witness automatically generates new perspectives both in our internal life, in terms of our emotions, our thoughts, and our body, as well as our external life, in our relationships and our behavior. And these new perspectives often are more reflected and more thoughtful than our knee-jerk reaction. And so as your ability to witness increases, you're going to find that there's a lot less emotional reactivity in your daily life, into daily stress, and that you're able to weather you know, traffic jams much better, um, people forgetting their part of whatever they were supposed to do in terms of either at work or at home, um, but you're just able to kind of weather, especially this, the little stresses, much more gracefully, that you become much more proactive in your life, meaning that you make responsive decisions and you take action towards the goals you want rather than kind of waiting for things to happen or avoiding what's going on that you're able to really reflect and make more thoughtful decisions and more thoughtful actions rather than, again, just the knee-jerk responses. There's also um, an increase in self-acceptance and self-compassion. And so basically people, um, one of the greatest predictors of actually being a happy person is, um, is its ability to have self-compassion for yourself. It's a greater predictor than even having quote-unquote high self-esteem, liking yourself a lot. Um, it's more important to have acceptance and compassion of yourself, and that's going to make you develop or become a happier person. And so also your acceptance of others increases, which basically ends up with a lot less decrease um, in conflict with others at work and at home and just kind of out in the general public that as your acceptance and tolerance of other increases, you're going to have a lot less conflict in your life. 
So when we get to the bottom line here, it's that mindfulness is not about changing or controlling your experience. It's about observing it. It's about witnessing it without judging it. And so it's not so, so much about changing your experience, changing what you're feeling. It's not trying to get yourself to relax or calm down. It's changing your relationship to your experience. It, instead of having that knee-jerk kind of stress response, you're able to have a more reflected response to what's going on. And so this is where the therapy uh, and the therapeutic ingredient of mindfulness seems to come in. So, so basically, what do you do to be mindful? There are actually many different types of mindfulness practice. Um, you can do it while doing daily activities. There's walking, there's eating. But the most classic form of mindfulness that is found in virtually every culture on the planet is mindfulness breathing, a mindfulness breath meditation. And the instructions are very, very simple. Doing it is a much more complicated matter, but the instructions are very, very simple. Basically, you focus on your breath. You're observing it in, in the inflow and the outflow of breath. You can focus on kind of having your, where your belly kind of rises and falls or where the air kind of goes in and out of your nostrils or actually some people kind of describe it almost as experiencing the whole inflow and outflow of the breath. But basically, you're, you're picking a focus um, somewhere in your breathing pattern there um, and just watching your breath, okay? The second part is that you're quieting your thoughts while you do that. So if you catch your mind wandering off, you gently bring your attention back to focusing on your breath. You'll notice that there are often um, a lot of external distractors, uh, sound, other people making noises, there could be uh, breezes coming in, smells, Whatever is going on on the outside will often distract your attention, and when that happens, you just bring your focus back to your breath. Similarly, we can even have internal distractors, kind of like a pain or a discomfort might um, come into your conscious awareness. And as long as it's not life-threatening, of course, um, you should just return your focus to your breath. Don't scratch the itch. You know, don't try to massage you know, a tight muscle. Just notice it and return your focus to your breath. So the instructions are fairly simple, um, but as we'll see is what happens when you start doing this, uh, most of us will lose focus within three to five seconds. And that's totally normal. That is expected. And what you will do is as your mind wanders off, as soon as you notice it wandering off, you just return your, your mind back to the focus, which is the breath in this case. And so if you do this for five minutes, your mind will constantly kind of move back and forth between being focused on the breath, wandering off, returning the focus, wandering off, returning the focus. And really the therapy is in the returning the focus part. So it's, you don't need to be upset um, if your mind wanders off because that's part of the process. It's supposed to be happening. And that just return your focus. And every time you're doing that, that is where you're getting a lot of the, the physical benefits of increasing your ability to, um, to focus and calm the nervous system down and back, actually kind of activate the de-stressing relaxation response. So what's actually going on as you do this is that you're beginning to unfuse your experience um, and unfuse with your internal experiences so that your thoughts are only thoughts and the, you are not your thoughts. You begin to cultivate a witness consciousness, ability to realize that just because you're thinking it, it doesn't mean that, that that's who you are. It doesn't define you. It also ends up abandoning control. So you're, you're working at abandoning efforts to control undesirable internal experiences, which ultimately gives them more power over you. If you've noticed, the more you try to control an urge or a thought, the more uncontrollable it becomes. And so the idea is just to watch it and don't try to arm wrestle um, with your internal experiences because we normally lose when we do that. And so what you're finding is that there's a greater possibility for self-correction the more you do this in terms of the more you're able to pause in your reactivity, the greater your ability to self-correct. Now, perhaps the single most difficult thing um, that most people encounter when they begin practicing mindfulness is they actually get to be pretty hard on themselves. So practicing mindfulness compassionately is really one of the most important things you can do. 
because this isn't about a competition. It's not about doing it right or wrong. There really isn't a wrong way to do this. There isn't a wrong way um, to go about this or to have a bad meditation because your mind wanders a lot. That, that's not what's going on here. And it's understanding that you're observing where your mind is today and that's where it's at. And it's supposed to be a non-judgmental process. And so it's so important that we add this element of compassion so that we don't get down on ourselves um, for watching how our minds work. Because most of us um, are pretty much universally a little bit shocked to see how erratic the mind is, how much it wanders, and how actually how little control we have over our minds. So this is not about doing it perfectly, and it's what you're going to find is if you practice this regularly, you can have several weeks of being very, very focused, and and then maybe have another couple weeks where you just can't focus at all, and it kind of waxes and wanes, and, and that's normal. It's also giving you a lot of information about how you're doing right now. Um, and so the point is that this is a practice. It's something that you return to on a regular basis to learn about yourself, to improve yourself, and that it, in that it's not this steady progress. Um, and oftentimes it becomes a barometer more than the steady uphill, you know, increase in progress and skill all the time. So being patient with yourself is very, very critical. In fact, for many people, the most therapeutic benefit is developing self-compassion and understanding and acceptance of just who you really are, how your mind actually works. So it's very important to add compassion to your practice. And so, and where we need the compassion actually is, you know, not when we're starting and focusing, but when the mind wanders off, and in that moment that you catch yourself, your mind wandering off, it's very important that you be compassionate and accepting that that is just what you have, your mind has just done. And to not judge it as good or bad, but simply to note that that is what has just happened. To just notice what is. Now, there are lots of different ways to do this. Um, one way is to kind of compassionately, non-judgmentally, you know, label it, oh, there's worrying again, there's thinking again, there's planning again. Um, some people like to just visualize the thoughts um, as like a cloud drifting off or a soap bubble popping once they realize um, that their mind has kind of wandered off. Some people like to smile and say to themselves, ah, yes, that too, and kind of just refer, you know, return back to the focus. So whatever you do, make it a moment of compassion and gentleness with yourself rather than reprimanding yourself for not doing it right. And gee, I can't focus today, and oh my goodness, I'm sure this is, you know, all I need to do is watch my breath, and I can't even do that too. What's wrong with me? Everyone else can do it. It's so much easier. You know, everyone, seems, everyone else seems to have no problem with this. So, and again, that is the therapy. The returning of the focus, if you're working on addressing um, especially mental or physical mental health issues like depression and anxiety and stress, pa chronic pain. The therapy is actually in the return of the focus because that is kind of actually what's rewiring the brain to manage stress better because that's it, the new neural impulse that's going through the brain that's rewiring the brain. Now if you are going for enlightenment, okay, with, or spiritual experiences, Longer periods without thought is more important if you're going for the more spiritual direction. But what for most of us are doing in the Western world, in everyday life, in terms of managing stress, the ebb and flow of focus, mind wandering off, and you know focusing again, that back and forth is actually where the therapy comes in terms of getting the type of brain chemistry changes and brain wave pattern changes that we're hoping for. So let's go ahead and try this. So go ahead, find a comfortable seat, sit back. And what I'm going to do is I am going to start a timer for three minutes. And you're going to hear a bell at the beginning. And once you hear the bell, begin focusing on your breath. And as soon as your mind wanders off, say, ah, oh, yes, that too. Oh, there's the wandering off she just described. Notice that and then just return to your breath without beating yourself up on the way to doing so. And we'll just, you'll do that many, many times over the next three minutes. And when you hear the bell, that's when you know you're done. Here we go.
So that was three minutes, and hopefully you had a good experience doing that. And what I recommend people do is start out with five minutes, five, five days a week, trying to attach it to something you do every day automatically, like your shower or brushing your teeth or um, before you go to bed at night. But, uh, you know, attach it to something you are already doing regularly and um, recommend you try it for a couple weeks and notice uh, if you notice any difference in your stress levels and your relationships. I have been continually just astounded as, at what people report, how simply doing five minutes of this a day can make a significant difference in numerous spheres in a person's life. So, wish you luck with it and thanks for listening.